such a delight to be back with you. I'm excited about being here this morning. We've started trial in Cleveland, Ohio. And so it, it is uh, uh, always a joy to get to come home on the weekend. It also freaks out every other lawyer that I'm, I, I would come home. And so uh, some of them may watch to find out if it's true. Uh, yes, it is true. Okay. And uh, it's a delight to have you guys here. Uh, you may be reading about the case. Uh, it, it is the National Opioid Trial. And so if you uh, uh, catch a glimpse of that, uh, uh, say a prayer uh, for uh, justice and all good things to happen. And so within the framework of that and the new grandson, it is a lot of fun and joy for me to get back here. But last week when we were up there, uh, there's an interesting game that was going on with the lawyers. So I'm thinking there's at least 50 or so lawyers up there uh, just for our side uh, that, that are, are squabbling and fussing, fighting and doing things, trying to get all of this stuff right. And in the process of that, some of the younger lawyers have started playing a game. There is a cultural phenomenon that has occurred in the last seven television seasons called Game of Thrones, and without commenting one way or another on the show, I will tell you that as part of the cultural phenomena, the game that is played by a certain group of the lawyers is which character are you, and which one are you, and who is Varys, and who is Ned Stark. By the way, Don Migliori is Ned Stark, who gets beheaded in season one, and he's very upset that he got to be a character that doesn't make it past season one, be that as it may. This is the, the issue, and I thought, how unusual, until I started thinking through my generation when we were young. We, when I was in high school, a number of us read Tolkien's Lord of the Rings, and we did very much the same thing. Which character are you? Are you Gandalf? Are you Aragorn who's going to save the day? Or are you Sam Gamgee who has trouble doing much of anything right? You know, uh, Bilbo Baggins. Who are you? And then I started thinking and I thought, you know, even playing basketball in the driveway, it was never Mark Lanier has the ball, he stops, he shoots. It was always Dr. J has the ball, he's driving for a big dunk. He decides instead to do a layup. Um, I never really was able to. I did touch the rim once right here with that little bit of the hand, but that was about it. So this idea of figuring out where you fit into a story, I've decided goes way back. And it's a useful thing because as we look at the story of the woman at the well today, I want you to ask yourself where you find characteristics, where you find traits, where you find experiences that you can relate to. Where do you find things that are part of your life? Where do you find things that you wish were part of your life? Are things that are part of your life or you wish were not part of your life? Personalize the story because the story is more than simply a narrative. Now with that said, I want to start by looking at the text. Let's look at it together and I'll, I'll add a few comments along the way, but, but just to give you an idea of where we're going with this today. So it's in John chapter 4 and uh, we've got it up on the overhead so we can look at it. Now Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard Jesus was making and baptizing more disciples than John. Although Jesus himself didn't baptize, but only his disciples. He left, this is Jesus, left Judea and departed again for Galilee. Now he had to pass through Samaria and he came to a town of Samaria called Sychar near the field that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there. So Jesus, wearied as he was from his journey, was sitting beside the well. It was about the sixth hour. Now let's pause for a moment and get ourselves into the, the, the age in which this story is unfolding. Jesus is walking, obviously. 
And this journey is one where he is going through a mountainous area. He gets to a town called Sychar, where, near where Jacob's well is. And Jesus is weary. Now a lot of people don't like to think of Jesus as weary. We've painted a picture of Jesus in a Superman cape. Where unless he's got kryptonite nearby, he's, he's always able to leap tall buildings in a single bound and faster than an express tr train. Or no, a bullet. Speedier than a bullet. Anyway, y'all know that thing. Let's not quibble over who killed who. Um, uh, um, so, so we tend to think of Jesus as Superman. He was human as well as divine. And he was tired. And I love the fact that John has this and, and injects this very human side of Jesus. Understand, John's already told us, Jesus spoke creation into being. He was the Word. Jesus is the light of the world. Jesus is the King of kings. He's Lord of lords. Jesus was with God from the very beginning. Jesus is God. And so within the framework of Jesus being all of these things, this world he, that came into existence through him, he just sits in the dirt there by the well. Just sits on the ground because he's tired. It's about the sixth hour. The sixth hour is noon. They started at uh, uh, six, started the clock at 6 a.m. in that sense. So the sixth hour is about noon. Now a woman from Samaria comes to draw water. If you're reading this at the time of John, you're already concerned. You got some cognitive dissonance, Dr. Bob, clinical psychologist that you are. Got some cognitive dissonance going on here because a woman's not supposed to be at the well at noon drawing water. She wasn't going to the water, to, to the well, with a, a, a Dixie cup that she could like stick in and, and have a swig. This is a deep well. She's got to take the tools to go down into the deep well. And she's got a jar to bring the water back in. These water jars are not, Jack and Jill went up the hill to fetch a pail of water. These are heavy clay jars of a good size. Because you've got to hold enough water for what you need. They've got not a wide mouth but a narrow mouth jar because you don't want the water sloshing out. Typically they'll have some, some rope and stuff around the base to hold them onto a stick or something so that you can carry it off your shoulders. Because it's extremely heavy. And you don't go to do that at noon in the heat of the day. That's a chore you do early in the morning so that you've got your water for the day. When it's cooler. Or you'll go in the cool of the evening to get your water for the night. But generally in the morning. So the reader of the story in that day and age is already a bit like, okay, something weird's happening here. Wonder why this woman felt it necessary to go at noon. The woman comes to draw water and Jesus says to her, Give me a drink. His disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a woman of Samaria? The Jews don't have dealings with Samaritans. Now remember, let's pause for a moment and let's go, let's go map. Remember if this is Israel, roughly. You've got Judah and the southern part of Israel down here. Judah is where you get the Jews from, that term. But there were ten tribes in the northern area... And those ten tribes were known as the Israel. And that is the ten tribes that were taken by the Assyrians and repopulated with other people. So those ten tribes got conquered by the Assyrians who were not able to conquer Judah. 
And so long before the Jews went into captivity in Babylon, this was resettled with new people who came in with their own pagan religions, but also adopted some of the religion of the area, which would have been a worship of Yahweh. This was the northern kingdom of Israel that was devoured. So these new people who repopulate and the few remaining Israelites that are there all interbreed. And so they are impure. Their religion is impure. They only, for example, embrace Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, the five books of Moses, the Pentateuch, the Torah. They didn't embrace any of the rest of the prophets or the Psalms or the other writings. And so you've got an impure religious people, an impure people, and frankly, the Jews detested them and the Samaritans detested the Jews. It was so bad that, well, at, at first, it wasn't, when the Jews went away to captivity in Babylon and they came back, the Samaritans offered to help rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. The Jews said, get away. You're, 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 you're fake. You're phony. You're inbred. You're, 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 you, you are disgusting. And we'll have nothing to do with you. Meanwhile, the, the Samaritans, they've got their own temple. They worship on Mount Gerizim in 128 B.C., the Jews go up and destroy the Samaritan temple. We have contemporary writings from the time of John that relate how Jewish people going through Samaria would often be accosted and robbed and beat up. We have the stories of, of the Jewish people going through Samaria and lighting villages on fire and doing damage and wrecking and pillaging in the Samaritan areas. There was great distaste. And you probably know this because you've heard all of this stuff taught in reference to Jesus making the good Samaritan the, 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 the hero of his story. But within the framework of this, that's, that's what we, we've got in the text. So the woman's a Samaritan. Jews don't have dealings with them. If we go back, oh, we're still on the Elmo. I just got to move it up there. Sorry, guys. Uh, Pivo, thank you. So Jesus answered and said, If you knew the gift of God, and who was saying to you, Give me a drink, you'd have asked him. And he'd have given you living water. Living water is an expression that was used in the Old Testament. It referenced water that flowed. Could be a spring that supplies a well, but it, it, as opposed to a cistern that just holds rainwater, or a mikvah that just held uh, uh, water that, that could stagnate. Living water was flowing water. The woman said, hey, you don't even have anything to draw water with from this well. You can't even get well water. Where are you going to get living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob. Jacob gave us this well. He gave us the well water. You think you're going to get living water? He gave us this well. He drank from it. So did his sons and his livestock. You greater than him? Jesus said, hey, anybody who drinks of this water is going to get thirsty again. But whoever drinks of the water that I'm going to give him will never be thirsty forever. It's the Greek word, I know Never be thirsty forever. The water I'll give him will become in him a spring of water welling up forever living, eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, uh, give me this water so I won't be thirsty or have to come here to draw water. Jesus said to her, Go call your husband and come here. Now the woman answered and said, I don't have a husband. Jesus said, you're right, saying, I don't have a husband. You've had five. And the one you have now is not your husband. The woman said, sir, I perceive you are a prophet. <laughs> and what do you do when 
as my dad would have said, Mom, he quit preaching and he went to meddling. <laughs> he got just a little too close to, for comfort. So you change the subject in a pious way. Uh, Sir, I perceive you're a prophet. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain. You say in Jerusalem is a place where people ought to worship. Jesus says, woman, <laughs> believe me, the hour's coming where it's not going to matter if it's on this mountain or in Jerusalem. And then he does kind of correct her theology a little bit. You worship, you Samaritans worship what you don't know. We Jews worship what we know. Salvation is from the Jews. But the hour's coming, and it's now here, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. Now, the woman says to Jesus, I know Messiah's coming. John adds, he who is called Christ, the reason why is Christ is the Greek word for Messiah. So he's letting his Greek readers in on that. I know Messiah's coming. When he comes, he'll tell us everything. Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. Now, then the disciples come back. They're marveled that he's talking with a woman, but nobody says, uh, 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 why are you doing that? You know, they, they, they treated Jesus with respect. They were just like stunned. So the woman left her water jar and she goes away into town and says to the people, she didn't even carry her water jar back. Come see a man who told me everything I ever did. Of course, Jesus clearly had more conversation with her than the three minutes we're seeing here. Can this be the, the Messiah, the Christ? So they left the town and were coming to him. Meanwhile, the disciples are saying, hey, Rabbi, eat. And he says, oh, I have food to eat you don't know about. They said to one another, who, who brought him food? Chick-fil-A. <laughs> Jesus said to them, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. Now, many of the Samaritans, I'm going to skip ahead, many Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. And it goes on to say, when the Samaritans came to him, they asked him to stay with him. He stayed there two days. Jesus stayed with the Samaritan two days. Many more believed because of his word. They said to the woman, it's no longer because of what you said that we believe. We've heard for ourselves. We know this is indeed the Savior of the world. All right, that's a long read for a Sunday morning class, but I want to make sure we got it in front of us because now we're going to go through the story a little bit better. Let's go back to our, uh, uh, y'all are already there, look at that. So here's our map. Jerusalem is down here where I put the Star of David. Are you able to see from where you are the red lines on this map? Those are the roads. Those are ancient roads. We know where the roads were. So we're able to say these are the roads. Now if Jesus wants to go up, whoops, go back up there. Jesus wants to go up to Galilee. There's a road that goes up there, but between Jerusalem and Galilee is Samaria. That's the danger spot. That's the bad place. That's where the the corrupt people are, that's where the impure people are, that's where the people are that you want to go <laughs> and not have anything to do with. The easy way to get from Jerusalem to Galilee is to go up the road to Galilee. But that goes right through Samaria. The alternative route that the Orthodox Jew would take comes out of Jerusalem down through Jericho across the Jordan River and then cuts all the way up and you bypass Samaria. Now you're looking at it saying what's the big deal? You have a car. 25 extra miles is no big deal in a car. But do you really want to walk 25 extra miles if you can avoid it? The Jews would. Because they didn't want to come into contact with the nasty Samaritans. The Jews and the Samaritans detested each other. So that's the, 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 the underlying cultural current 
that draws a huge illustration in this story that we're going to miss if we fail to remember John chapter 3. We added chapters. John didn't have chapter divisions. John's just one flow of the pen down the columns. We added the chapters. So this story is being told directly after the story of Nicodemus. Nicodemus was the righteous Pharisee who came to Jesus one night and had this long dialogue. And Jesus said to him, you have to be born anew. You have to be born again. You have to be born from above. You've, you've, you, you can't just expect to live this life without finding a new life. And so that dialogue, and that's that famous verse, God so loved the world, the world that he gave his only son. That whoever believes in him won't perish but will have eternal life, life forever. So this is the contrast that's being set. Nicodemus was an Orthodox Jew. I mean, he had it down. He was a teacher. He was, a, he was an Orthodox Jew who you look at him and you think, man, that guy does it for the God. I mean, he's willing to go to great lengths to do it for God. The way he dresses, the way he eats, the way he speaks, the way he moves, how he spends his time, how he tithes all the way down to the garden herbs he picks. This is a holy Joe. Now again, I just want to know which character you are. You might be the Holy Joe. You might be a really, really good person with great ethics and, and convictions. Wonderful. John chapter 3, there you are. Or you might be this woman Jesus encounters. Please understand, this woman had some things going against her. Strike one. She was a Samaritan. An Orthodox Jew like Nicodemus should have nothing to do with a Samaritan. Jesus has just gone from one to the other extreme. Strike two, this woman was a woman. <laughs> let, let, let's, let's review for a moment. Let's review for a moment. Culturally, women were treated differently then than they are now. Praise God. <laughs> Culturally, then, women were to be seen, not heard. And you weren't supposed to see that much of them. Culturally, then... To an Orthodox Jew, women were not even supposed to study the Bible. One rabbi equated teaching, it said it's more valuable to burn the Torah up than to teach it to a woman. Jesus was not that way, by the way. When Jesus comes into the home of Mary and Martha, and Martha's all busy in the kitchen, Mary's getting to sit with the men and listen to the rabbi teach. That's what upset Martha so much. Tell Mary she belongs here in the kitchen. She's not supposed to be out there with the men learning this stuff. And Jesus has to say, hey, she's picked the right thing, man. You ought to get in on this. It's not bad. <laughs> Don't take away from her what I'm giving to her. Let her learn. But, but that's not the way Orthodox Judaism treated women. They couldn't even, you couldn't sit with your wife in synagogue. They had separate seating areas. Men weren't supposed to converse with women because A, it's a waste of time. B, the only reason you'd be doing it is if you had some perverse interest. And C, that's going to lead to a dalliance. So it just didn't happen. 
So strike two, the woman's a woman. Strike three, she's out. Because she's a sexual sinner on top of everything else. So I don't know which character you are. I don't know where you, your life has led you. But I do know that one point of this story is when it comes to the work of Jesus, it doesn't matter. Because that righteous Pharisee needed the work of Jesus just as much as that three strikes you're out sinful Samaritan woman. Doesn't matter. In fact, one of the more interesting contrasts of the story is the righteous one comes to Jesus and Jesus explains to him that he needs new life. He needs to put his trust in Jesus. The Samaritan woman doesn't come to Jesus. She comes to the well. Jesus meets her there and he seeks her out. He engages her. See, we've got to understand, I told you John's a love story. John is the story of, yes, we can seek God. We can know there's got to be more to life. We can be intrigued by him. We can say, hey, what is this Christian stuff? But more than that, we need to know God's pursuing us. God's coming after us. God's the one saying, I want to engage you and draw you in to a relationship with me. So you've got the, the righteous Jew, and you can see that Jesus might come for those righteous Jews. But the point of this story is, in part, Jesus is indeed the Savior of the whole world, Jew and Gentile alike. And so even as John weaves this story, John uses language that runs parallel to his passion narrative. The passion being the time where Christ... Uh, 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 goes to the cross in John 19. So here you've got Jesus sitting down because physically he's worn out. He's weary. He's in distress. So he's got to just sit, get some water. Let the, the apostles go get food. Bring them back to him. In John 19, Jesus is in physical distress. He's getting beaten, spit upon, uh, uh, his, he, they put a crown of thorns on him. He's getting cut. He's getting flogged. He's, he's, he's having to carry his own cross. He's weary. He's in physical distress. In this passage, Jesus is thirsty. In, in the Passion, he's on the cross. John 19, 28 says, I thirst. In this passage, Jesus is doing this stuff and John says it's the sixth hour. He does, John gives the sixth hour again in John 19 verse 14 in the Passion narrative. The Passion is Jesus saving the world. And this story mirrors or runs parallel to the Passion because John does not want his readers to fail to see. That Jesus came not just to save the Jews, but to save all people. He came to save the world. His passion on the cross wasn't for the Jew only. He didn't just die so that the Jews could have their sins atoned for beyond the sacrifice that happens on Yom Kippur. He didn't come just for the Jews. He came for the world. And if you look at this in John 4.34, I circled this when I was reading through it with you. John 4.34, he said the following. He says, My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. That's the Greek verb teleo. And that's what Jesus is about here. Teleo is the word accomplish, means finish, it means complete. It's the exact same verb that's used in John 19 verse 30 when Jesus is on the cross and he says it is finished. He did accomplish the work. He finished that work. You know, the, the Greek is so wonderful. The Greek is so wonderful. Jesus 
Look at this. I gave you the map about Jesus going through there. This ties in closely to his will. This whole story started out in John chapter 4. Jesus learned, he left Judea, departed for Galilee, and he had to pass through Samaria. You say, well, wait a minute, Mark, your map didn't show he had to. Your map showed he chose to. Could have gone the long way. He clearly wasn't pressed for time. He spent an extra two days there. Why does it say he had to? He had to. That's a Greek verb. Let's get, make sure I'm on the right place. There we go. That's a Greek verb. The Greek verb is deo. Deo means it's necessary. It's something that, that it, it, it must be done. And so the form here is in the, it's in the imperfect tense. It's ide. The form here means that, that Jesus was doing something continuously because it was necessary. It wasn't necessary because of geography. It wasn't necessary because of timing. It was necessary because he was doing the will of God. When John uses this verb, and John uses it over and over again, he uses this verb to say the mission of God. It's God that told him to do it, and that's why he had to do it. See, this verb is used in, in John 3.14. Let me just show you some different places, because you don't pick up on this in English. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. Deo. Must. It's, it's the mission of God. Jesus was compelled to do the mission of God. The same verbs used in John 9, 4. John 9, 4, where he, Jesus heals a blind man. Jesus says, we must work the works of him who sent me while it's day or night. It's something we must do. John 10, 16. Jesus says... I have other sheep that are not of this fold. I must bring them also. This is the will of God. This is Jesus doing what God tells him to do. John 20 verse 9. The resurrection. The resurrection's occurred. The disciples goes in. He sees and believes. For as yet they didn't understand the scripture. He must rise from the dead. See, John ties that to the mission of God. Jesus is there to finish, if we go back to the PowerPoint, finish the mission of God. And that's found on the cross. He's doing this because he's compelled to obey God. And it's a salvation for everybody, regardless. And Paul says the same thing. Paul puts it this way. There's neither Jew nor Greek. There's neither slave nor free. There's no male or female. You're all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ, then you're Abraham's offspring. You're heirs according to the promise. It doesn't matter your genesis. Spell that. Doesn't matter. All right. You got that? Now, another part of this story that I want to, to, to roll over to is I want you to see the growth of faith by this woman engaging and studying the revelation of God. Anybody who's walked with the Lord for much time at all will be able to bear out the testimony I'm going to give you. The more you engage with God, the more you study His Word, the more you grow in your faith. I'm going to say it again. The more you engage with God, the more you study His Word, the more you grow in faith. Say, oh, I've been weak in my faith. Engage with God. Study His Word. Seek Him out. Next Sunday, I've got the, the, the blessing of getting to be able to preach big church during the 9.30 hour. Uh, yeah, right. Let's wait see what God can do in spite of me. Um, but it's also Communion Sunday. 
And it's really a chance for us to engage with God. If you can pray for me this week, pray that in my preparation, I'll, I'll prepare in such a way to help people engage with Him. Not just learn about Him. I don't want to just learn where the good restaurant is. I want to go eat there. So I thought, how can I best illustrate this? How can I really choose some really good words to show you the way this woman grew in her faith through her engagement of Jesus and learning and the revelation he gives? And I came up with some things I thought were decent, but honestly did not hold a candle to what Ephraim the Syrian said about 200 years. He's born about 200 years after John writes this, a little over maybe. But he's in the 300s. And he was this really cool guy. So he's born in what's now modern Iraq. Uh, Nasibi was the town. And, and he's um, brought up by Christian parents. He uh, becomes uh, uh, celibate. He doesn't marry. And he becomes a monk in part, but also a teacher. And he writes a lot of hymns. He's got a real lyrical way about him. So he was commenting on this 18, 1,700 years ago. And here's what he said. It beats my wording, anything I can come up with. First... She caught sight of a thirsty man, then a Jew, then a rabbi, afterwards a prophet, last of all the Messiah. She tried to get the better of the thirsty man. She showed her dislike of the Jew. She heckled the rabbi. She was swept off her feet by the prophet, and she adored the Messiah. Yeah, he does better than me. <laughs> Isn't that just incredible? That's what happens when you engage God and you study and you learn more of Him and, and what He does. And you see this God is the, this. So P Pastor David and I were in um, Boston um, last week before last. And I, I had a chance to, to, to speak at Harvard Law School on a few different events. And uh, uh, Pastor David went with me and, and one of the things we did is a Bible study up there. And, and I loved him engaging some of those law students as he told them. He said, you know, what, what we've got to remember is we have a God who pursues us. God's coming after us. I mean, look, most people, there are some pretty fancy people in this world who you might get an audience with. But this is not, gee, take a number and wait in line and one day God's going to pay attention to you. This is an understanding that the God who created everything is willing to set aside his Godhead and come onto earth and be, take on a physical form where he's wearied, where he has to sit down for rest on the very dirt he made. wonder if when he made it he thought, hey, that's the dirt where I'm going to sit down when I become human and get tired. Well, let's make that a little softer. I would have. I don't think he did. He's just, this is it. And that God loves us enough to pursue us. To chase after us. To seek us out. Got it? So I don't know if that's you or not. I don't know where you find yourself in this story. But if you find yourself there, grab that character and grow engagement and faith and revelation what about this water stuff I talked about this a little bit ago but if you look at it carefully he says if you knew the gift of God and who it is saying to you give me a drink you would have asked him and he'd have given you living water living water flowing look do you know the problem with water wells do not go to your average water well and dip, dip your cup down there and get you something to drink. Do you know why? All sorts of things have been in that water. Before Becky and I could even go hold our grandson, who I don't know if I've told you or not, but I have it on good authority as the cutest infant there's ever been. Before we could do that, we had to go get these shots they have to give you know, like the flu shot and, and, and whooping cough and stuff like that. It was really brutal. And, and I don't like shots. 
Coach, you'd, you'd, have, you'd have appreciated it. The woman, she bent three needles before she told me to quit flexing because it was just too hard. <laughs> okay, I lied on that point. Let's be real clear. There's a lie in church. I confess he's faithful to forgive. Now, um, stagnant water's just not a real great drink. Living water's what you want. That fast-flowing, clean stream where the pigeons aren't sitting there doing the things pigeons do. So, so Jesus is saying, I got something better than you. But Jesus isn't making up the word. Jesus is using a, a, a metaphor that's found in the Old Testament over and over in places like Jeremiah 2.13, Jeremiah 17.13. I, yeah, let's do one of them. Let's do Jeremiah 2.13, just uh, uh, even though we don't really have time to. Jeremiah 2.13. But it gives you a flavor for how this water stuff is used. 2.13. My people have committed two evils. They've forsaken me, the fountain of living waters. And they hewed out cisterns for themselves that can't hold water. Jesus is telling her, I'm going to give you the living water. This is, by the way, the Lord, Jehovah, Yahweh talking. Hashem, Adonai. This is the Lord saying, I'm the fountain of living waters. Jesus is making a very strong claim of deity here. And he's offering it to her. Now she didn't read Jeremiah. She's a Samaritan. She like ends with Deuteronomy. But the metaphor is not lost on anybody else. The metaphor is found in the Song of Solomon. The metaphor is found in the Psalms. You who are thirsty, come drink of him. And he gives you life. He sustains your spirit. If, 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 you know, the Psalms, my soul thirsts for thee in a dry and weary land where there is no water. And he says, I'm going to give you that water. But he's talking also about his spirit that he puts inside of us. When we come to him and say, Lord, I don't have it all figured out, but I'm yours. Everything I am and everything I'm not. Just give me, take care of me. I, I'm not, I don't even got all this down, but I'm yours. And he puts within us his spirit. That's that being born again. Being born from above. And it changes who we are. And as we figure out our character, uh, I, I'm concerned. Are we going to be the woman who's sitting there trying to cling to this dirty old well that's had pigeons in it for well over a thousand years? years dates back to the patriarchs so that's almost 2,000 years or are we going to get that fresh water you know do we cling to dead ritual rather than draw from the spirit of the living Christ or are we so convinced it's going to be our way that we fail to see that God offers a new freshness And I, I love this. Everyone, I want to tell you something. If you're clinging to old ritual instead of embracing the living Spirit of God, you will stay thirsty, my friend. Everyone who drinks of that water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks of the water that Jesus gives him will never be thirsty again because it will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. And that not only means that God's Spirit works in me, but will work through me to teach and to share and to, to bring his light to others. That's the way it works. All right. So as we're sorting through this, maybe that appeals to you. Who are you? Where do you find yourself in this story? Um, I will tell you this. Don't try to outsmart God. I mean, look, look at this passage. Jesus said to her, go call your husband and come here. The woman answers him, I have no husband. Jesus said, you got that right. Uh, uh, I have no husband because you've had five and the one you're living with right now is not your husband. What you've said is true. 
Now, we miss a little bit here if we're not doing this in the Greek. Because, as I've told you many times, we're going to zoom out a little bit and make this easier. As I've told you many times, Greek has a different way of showing emphasis than we do in English. So in English, I can say, this is, oops, hold on, hold on, hold on, there you go. This is important. And I can add an exclamation mark, and I can underline it and put it in a different color ink, and I can take a highlighter, and I can highlight it, and I can, can draw stars around it, and I can do emojis on it, and I can do all sorts of things to let you see the point I'm trying to make, the emphasis. Right? In Greek, one of the principal ways you show emphasis is word order. We don't really get to do that much in English. We do occasionally, but not much. Because word order is often very important for our grammar. The difference between saying, oh mercy, okay, God's word's gone through worse before. <laughs> the difference in saying, I love Becky, I is the subject, love is the verb, Becky is the direct object, I love my wife. If instead I say, Becky loves I, and you'd say, well, your grammar's wrong because when you're the direct object, you need to change it to me. Okay, fine. The word order has changed who does the loving. Becky loves me. Greek, the word order doesn't matter because in terms of what the words mean. And the sentence means, because every word wears a little sign around its head. And the sign says something like, I'm a direct object. I'm a D-O. Or here you can say, I'm, I am the subject. I'm a subject. And it wears a little sign. A, 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 it gets extra letters to tell you what it is, how it functions. And because of that, word order is extremely important because word order is what point you want to make your emphasis. They didn't have exclamation marks. They didn't have change the color pen. They didn't have underline it or write it in all caps. That's not what they did. Okay? Now, why do I say all of this? Because the Greek, the word order is really, really cool. Jesus says, go call your husband. And here's the woman. So the woman says, here we'll put a skirt on her so you know she's a woman, okay? The woman says, quote, ook echo andra. Um, ook is, um, ook, ook uh, means not, not. And that's her first word, not echo. Um, I have. A uh, husband is just on draw. And I don't remember. I think it accents there. Whoops. Not I have husband. A husband. Jesus says, go call your husband. Not I have a husband. And then Jesus answers and he changes the word order. Jesus says, instead of ook, echo, andra, he puts andra first. Andra, or husband, and that's his emphasis. Husband, ook, not, echo, except he doesn't say echo because that means I have. He changes it to you have. Not I have a husband? And he says, husband? You don't have to. Right. Oh, ho, ho, ho. I mean, she's like, oh, I don't have a husband. And he's like, ha, 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 yeah, you got five. 
And the guy you're living with right now is not one. Don't, don't hide that with your little word gamesmanship. Don't try to trick me. Oh, I don't have a husband. I've been through five of them. Don't have one now. Jesus says, don't try to trick me. You are who you are. I mean, do you think Jesus at that point cares how many husbands she has had? Oh, I mean, he cares for the difficulties she's been through. He cares for the hurt in her life and all the rest. He wants her to take that moment in history and become his child. He wants to be in a relationship with her regardless of whether she's had 5, 50, or 500 husbands. Right there at that moment, in that place and time, he's speaking to her. And she's trying to play games because she wants to make herself look prettier than she is. I got news for you. We ain't so pretty compared to the beauty of God. But he loves us anyway. He didn't pick any of us because of how we look physically or spiritually. He didn't pick any of us because we picked him first. While we were yet sinners, he died for us. Oh mercy, I'm out of time. Don't think you can distract God. This woman tries to distract him. Start talking about other things. That doesn't work. Whoops, there you go. That doesn't work. I'll tell you, I was that character. Yesterday morning. I was driving to, uh, I was in Boca. I'd gone through Chick-fil-A to take, because the child, the, our grandson's like, at this point, eight days old or nine days old, so he's ready for Chick-fil-A. And, <laughs> and if he doesn't want it, I'll eat it for him. And so I uh, drive through Chick-fil-A, and I'm thinking as I'm driving to their house, I'm thinking, you know, you get that niggling feeling inside you that just says, hmm, just, just nagging at me, saying, I, 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 need to, I, need, I need to listen to my Christian play mix. And I thought, ah, uh, more in the mood just to have background music. I don't want to. And I thought, no, I need to listen to it. I'm thinking, I really, I really, that's going to, that's a hassle. Just, I'm just going to turn on them. And I thought, wait a minute. This nagging won't go away in my head. What's the downside to listening to it? So I put it on, and a song comes on, and it is exactly what I needed to hear at that moment that changed my perspective on my life right now. And the traffic was just bad enough to where I got to listen to that entire song before I went to the next one. And even had a chance to dictate a quick note to myself. Because it changes the way I view something going on right now. Don't try to distract God. Don't try to play games with God. Don't try to be who you're not with God. Know that God is chasing you. And so that's the take home. The take home is you are someone who God loves. God loves you you not because you're good enough not because you're so lovable some of us aren't so lovable some of us aren't good enough all of us aren't good enough but God loves us anyway I mean this is that's part of that John story it's God so loved the world but it goes further than that you and I aren't just someone that God loves Someone who God loves. We're also someone who God saves. He's Savior of the world. There's nobody so bad that they're not saved. And when they are saved, when they are born anew, they are as far from that sin and who they were before as the east is from the west. And don't ever let it chain around your neck otherwise. Because you and I are also someone who God changes. He doesn't leave us like we are. She goes into town. She comes back out. And many Samaritans in that town believed in him because of what that woman said. That's incredible. That's the work of God. Jesus had to go through Samaria 
not because of geography, not because of theology, but because he was on mission for God and he wasn't going to end until it was finished. In the same way Paul says, he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion in the day of Christ Jesus. God has started changing you. He will not end until he's done. We have that promise. So with that, let me bless you in the name of Jesus and let's go. Father, we do bless you in the name of Jesus. We, in the name of Jesus, by the great atoning work of our Messiah, we say to you, Lord, speak to us. Draw us out. Put your water, your spirit inside us and let it flow through us and wash us anew. Give us a better glimpse of who you are. A greater engagement with you, Father. May we not run from you, but run to your open arms as you pursue us in love through Jesus. Amen.